Hi, good afternoon. My name is Laura Myers. I am the manager of volunteers and gallery learning at the Senator John Heinz History Center. Thanks for joining us this afternoon for our ongoing series, Uncovering Pittsburgh Stories. This is a series that started with our docents. Those are our volunteers who give tours in our gallery spaces while our building was closed to the public. We were giving tours. Um, we wanted to find ways to keep sharing what we were learning about the history of Pittsburgh and this region with our visitors online in a virtual format. Now that our building has reopened, uh, we have continued this series. And at this point, we're transitioning it a little bit so that we can tell stories that are specific to our latest exhibit, um, Smithsonian's Portraits of Pittsburgh. We're looking at particular portraits and telling the stories behind those. And that's part of an ongoing effort for us to focus on um, the portraits and the stories that, those, that that exhibit brings for us. So we hope that you'll join us today and in the future for more of our Uncovering Pittsburgh Stories. Today's Uncovering Pittsburgh Stories is going to be George Washington in Western Pennsylvania. Um, I'm going to introduce Clive Kimblin, who's one of our docents, who will be giving this presentation. Afterwards, there will be a live Q&A section to the talk. So please feel free to add your questions into the chat menu and we'll uh, ask those once the presentation is over. And then we hope you'll join us for others. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen in just a second. In discussing the presence of George Washington in Western Pennsylvania, and also the influence of Western Pennsylvania on his development as a leader, I was making use of three portraits that are currently on view at the Heinz History Center on loan from the Smithsonian Museum. I would like to begin by drawing your attention to portrait number one, entitled General George Washington, 1780. This portrait was commissioned by the Marquis de Lafayette, a Frenchman who fought alongside George Washington during the Revolutionary War. We are looking at a print prepared from a French engraving of a painting by a French artist. Neither the artist nor the engraver had actually met George Washington. So Lafayette, insisted that the figure of Washington be copied from an earlier work by the American Charles Wilson Peale. Peale had indeed painted Washington from a life pose. We will return to the Frenchman Lafayette later, but let's first discuss the portrait. We have a full figure of Washington, the commander in chief of the Continental Army, standing in front of a military tent with a military encampment in the background. In his right hand, he is clutching the Declaration of Independence. And in addition, France's 1778 Treaty of Alliance with the United States of America. And underfoot, he is trampling on various British proclamations. Lafayette is emphasizing two points. One, Washington's military leadership and secondly, and in particular, French support for the revolution. But what, you might ask, is the significance of this portrait to Western Pennsylvania? The portrait shows that in 1780, George Washington, as commander in chief of the Continental Army, is fighting against the British with assistance from the French. But ironically, he obtained that military experience about 20 years earlier, fighting with the British against the French in Western Pennsylvania. Let's explore this further. In 1753, Western Pennsylvania was largely unpopulated by European settlers. In New France, Canada, there were about 80,000 settlers and the 13 colonies to the east of the Alleghenies numbered about 2 million. This is a big difference in colonial populations. However, both regions could draw on strong military support 
from their home countries, France and Britain. There were, of course, Native American tribes in the area, some of whom, such as the Seneca, had moved to the area and away from the colonies. In the north, the settlers of New France were allied with the Iroquois. The rights to this area, Western Pennsylvania, were disputed between France and Britain. But initially, this frontier, frontier area was not of particular interest. However, in the mid 1700s, these countries and their colonies were waking up to this region's major strategic value. Basically, if it rained on the colonies located east of the Alleghenies, the water would flow to the Atlantic. If it rained in this area, the water would flow west and eventually enter the Gulf of Mexico. The rivers were the highways of the time and Western Pennsylvania at the source of the Ohio was the key to westward expansion. Could I have PowerPoint number one, please? In 1749, the French made a provocative move. A French officer, Céléron de Baville, was sent by the governor of New France to place lead plates into the banks of the Ohio and its tributaries, essentially stating all the lands watered by these rivers are French territory. Obviously, this was not well received in the British colonies. And in 1753, the royal governor of Virginia sent George Washington, a young, ambitious militia officer, aged 21, over the Alleghenies to reconnoiter the situation. George had one companion, Christopher Gist. George Washington had a courteous diplomatic meeting with the French at Fort Le Boeuf, located in the headwaters of the Allegheny, where he was essentially told, go home young man, this is French territory. It was December of 1753, and in returning to Virginia, Washington almost drowned. He crossed the Allegheny near the present location of Lawrenceville, walking across the unstable, icy surface. He fell into the river and was saved by Christopher Gist. Suspecting that the French were fortifying the junction of the rivers that formed the start of the Ohio, with the overall objective of controlling access to the West, the following year, 1754, the governor of Virginia sent George Washington back over the Alleghenies to, to determine what actions were the French were taking in this area and to impose British dominance. He commanded a force of about 200 colonial militia and 100 redcoats. It was the height of summer and they had to hack their way through the forest as they moved over the Alleghenies towards the present Pittsburgh. At one point, they camped at a clearing in the woods now called Great Meadows, located in the mountains above the present city of Uniontown. And it was there that the Seneca leader, Tanakhreshen, warned Washington that a party of French soldiers was nearby. What was happening was that Washington was marching west towards Pittsburgh to find what the French were doing. In fact, they had already built Fort Duquesne and the French had sent out a group of about 30 soldiers to march east to find out what Washington was doing. But Tanagreshen went a step further. He suggested that Washington ambush the French. Basically, he knew that the Seneca were going to be dominated by either the French or the British. He considered that domination by the British would be the lesser of two evils that ambushing the French would lead to a war and that the British would eventually win that war. Washington did indeed successfully ambush the French with many French soldiers killed or captured. However, there were two major problems. It was known that one soldier had escaped and it was obvious that he'd return west to alert the main French force. And second, they had killed a French officer, 
Humanville. Now, killing French privates in an ambush was bad, but killing a French officer was a diplomatic blunder that led eventually to seven years of conflict between France and Britain, including the so-named French and Indian War involving Britain, France, and France's formidable tribal allies, the Iroquois. Could we view the painting of Fort Necessity at Great Meadows, please? Fearing a French attack, Washington returned to Great Meadows and constructed a defensive stockade in the center, Fort Necessity. However, the expected attack didn't occur immediately, and he continued his march towards what is now known as the Point, land where the Allegheny and Monongahela rivers merged to form the Ohio. But near present-day Brownsville, Beside the Monongahela River, he learned that the French and their Iroquois allies were marching towards him. He immediately retreated to his fortified position at Great Meadows, to the stockade and the encircling trenches, and awaited a frontal attack. But the French and their Iroquois allies were strategic in their actions. Having surrounded the meadow, they stayed hidden in the tree line and spent the whole of that rainy summer day picking off Washington's men. As night fell, Washington had to surrender. And the document of surrender, written in French, included the phrase, I, we, assassinated a French officer. Back in Europe, this admission was sufficient to start the seven years of war between France and Britain. For now, Washington and his remaining men were allowed to march back to Virginia, while the French, after burning the stockade to the ground, returned to Fort Duquesne. Could I have PowerPoint two, please? The following year, the British sent 2,000 soldiers across the Atlantic to oust the French from Fort Duquesne in particular and from Western Pennsylvania in general. The troops were led by General Braddock, who split his force and marched forward with a force of 1,000 soldiers. George Washington accompanied Braddock as an aide de camp. It was summertime. The water level in Monongahela was low, so the column first forded the river near Brownsville and then recrossed below present day Kennywood. They were marching through the forest in good order less than 10 miles from Fort Duquesne when disaster struck. The, strength, the French and the Iroquois ambushed the column in a battle that came to be known as the Massacre on the Monongahela. It was essentially a battle between a skilled guerrilla force with the French and the Iroquois wearing buckskin and the British redcoats who were used to set piece battles. Hundreds of British soldiers were killed. General Braddock was mortally wounded and the remaining soldiers were forced to retreat. George Washington was in the thick of the fighting, had horses shot from under him, but retreated without injury. The British fought long and hard before renewing their tank. But three years later, they marched forward with 10,000 soldiers. This force was led by General Forbes. George Washington accompanied Forbes as the leader of the Virginia militia. And this time they were successful. The French garrison at Fort Duquesne, realizing that they were hopelessly outnumbered, burned Fort Duquesne to the ground and left this area never to return. General Forbes and Washington entered this area in triumph, and the British hold on the Ohio River was sealed by the construction of Fort Pitt. Washington then returned to domestic life in Virginia. The French and British continued to fight, however, with the French not only losing claims in North America, but also losing New France, now Canada. Could you view PowerPoint three, please? 
But what were the repercussions of the French and Indian War relative to the subsequent 1776 Declaration of Independence? First, with losses in America, Canada, Europe, and the subcontinent of India, the French had been humiliated by their arch enemy, Britain. They were eager to support future insurrections against the British. Second, wars are expensive, and King George of Great Britain wanted to impose taxes on the colonies to help defray the cost of military protection. This would be opposed by the colonists, taxation without representation. But most important, as a result of military experience gained during the French and Indian War, the colonists now had a military leader, a leader not only proven in battle, but also familiar with British army structure and tactics. And during the next years, Washington, from his Mount Vernon estate and leadership positions within Virginia, was becoming sympathetic to the winds of change, lowing towards independence that were affecting the colonies. So let's go back to portrait number one. Here we see Washington as the commander in chief of the Continental Army as appointed by the Continental Congress in 1775, qualified for this position through experience gained in Western Pennsylvania. And he's holding the French 1778 Treaty of Alliance that included military support, a treaty that was motivated in part by France's humiliating defeats occurring first in Western Pennsylvania. And if we zoom in further, Lafayette, who commissioned this painting, would have taken great delight with the inclusion of British proclamations being trampled underfoot. And who was this French aristocrat, the Marquis de Lafayette? This portrait from 1825 shows the man who, with military training, came to America at the age of 19 to fight in the War of Independence. He then returned to France and was instrumental, together with Ben Franklin and others, in developing France's 1778 Treaty of Alliance. This ensured vital French military support of both supplies and soldiers. He returned to the Revolutionary War and proved an effective general, eventually commanding an American division in Virginia and participating in the siege of Yorktown and the Chesapeake. At that siege, Washington's army included 6,000 French regulars. And the presence of these soldiers, together with the presence of a French fleet in the Chesapeake Bay, contributed to the final British surrender in October 1781. Years later, in 1824, and as the last remaining general from the War of Independence, Lafayette made a triumphant tour of America that included a hero's welcome in Pittsburgh. And as a side note, he had one son who, perhaps not surprisingly, he named George Washington de la Lafayette. This final portrait of George Washington dates from 1800, one year after his death. It was intended to commemorate Washington as the nation's founding father. Washington is central to the painting with flags and cannon in the foreground and stormy seas in the background. During his lifetime, he had evolved into a man known for his political acumen, for persuasive arguments, for perseverance and for his impressive organizational skills. These organizational skills were absolutely essential as needed, for example, in forging an effective fighting force from a newly formed continental army and the various colonial militias. And Western Pennsylvania certainly provided a test for his political acumen. As the first president of America, he needed money for the federal treasury. And in order to obtain that money, he imposed taxes on whiskey produced 
in Western Pennsylvania. This led to the Whiskey Rebellion. The irony here is that the colonies had rebelled against the British in part because of taxes, taxes without representation. And now he had to deal with an internal tax rebellion, but this time taxation with representation. Here I note that Pittsburgh's Neville Island is named after the collector of these unpopular taxes. Could I have the final PowerPoint, please? In closing, I would like to summarize the impact of General of George Washington on Western Pennsylvania, and conversely, the impact of activities in Western Pennsylvania on George Washington himself. First, he played an important role in extending British influence to Western Pennsylvania and the Ohio Valley. As a consequence, the British gained control of the rivers, which, as the highways of the time, were key to westward expansion. Second, his diplomatic and military experiences in this area, both the losses and the triumphs, developed the leadership skills and military prowess required for his subsequent role as Commander-in-Chief of the Continental Army. And French military defeats precipitated by the French and Indian War, first in Western Pennsylvania, but then in other parts of the world, had a major impact on the subsequent War of Independence. The French had been humiliated by Britain and were eager to support insurrections against their arch enemy. George Washington, the commander in chief, capitalized on this situation and embraced French support. And finally, as the first president of the United States of America, it is noted that Washington's political acumen must have been severely tested by having to quell the Whiskey Rebellion, a rebellion taking place on land that he'd once fought to liberate. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Clive, for that talk. Thank you. <laughs> um, well, I'm, we're going to open it up to questions now. Anybody who has them, feel free to write them in the chat. I'm going to kick us off and get started. Clive, you and I have worked together for a couple of years now. And I know that without fail, if you're giving your tour, <laughs> that you want to start on our fifth floor in Clash of Empires. And so I asked this question and know a little bit of the answer, which is, um, what made you pick this story, or what is it about um, starting at this place that you think is so important? No, I mean, when I take students around the, the History Center, I like to start there because it, it is talking about how did Pittsburgh come to be? What, what was important about this, this area? So going to the French and Indian War certainly gives the people an idea of what was happening 250 years ago, whatever and the importance also of the rivers. And then having fought with the French to actually gain this land, then you can go down to innovators, which is more or less saying, okay, you've got this land, now what are you going to do with it? And that is basically, when you go through innovators, one of the first tasks or one of the first things, the contributions of this area to American history is the actual building of boats to use on those rivers. Uh, the uh, Lewis and Clark expedition, for example, their keel boat was, was built in this area. So for a long time, this was indeed the place for westward expansion. And of course, you end up getting into iron, coal, all the rest of it. But I just find it a foundation for you're, you're struggling for this area. And it's a very good beginning to now what you're going to do with this area. And that's innovators. That's why. <laughs> it's a favorite. Well, we have some questions that um, Nate's been sharing with me over on YouTube. Um, the first question was the date on the first painting was 1780. Was the audience for that wartime paintings Americans or Europeans? I think the audience was for, for Europeans. I mean, this, this is, 
Marquis de Lafayette is commissioning this particular work for internal con consumption. So he's using French paintings, French painter, an artist, he's using a French engraver. I think it would be for internal consumption. Um, and he'd, he'd already sold the alliance with France. So 1778 was that, so this is two years later. But again, he's probably substantiating himself that he made the correct choice in, in backing George Washington, yes. And then can you tell us more about the allegorical elements of the first and third paintings? And this gets a little bit, I pulled up um, those slides. So if you want me to share either of those images, but it also ties for me, I think a little bit um, to a question that we talked about, which was how we pick a particular piece of a portrait and we focus on that. And I know in the exhibit, um, we focus on a different piece of that first portrait, the 1780 portrait with George Washington to talk about um, his personal valet, the enslaved man in the back of the portrait. So I was gonna pull up one of those if that's helpful for you to look at while we're talking. I think yes, please, yes. I'm gonna just navigate on my computer for a second to do that. You can go ahead and start and I'll pull up the first image. Um, well, that, that first image obviously is showing the, the emphasis is on George Washington. However, there is also a, a very large horse next to him and there is a valet holding the, the horse's bridle. It's not for sure, but there is speculation that the valet there is uh, William Lee, who was the, the personal servant to George Washington, an enslaved person who was with Washington from the age of 17. Uh, again, if it is William Lee and it, and it is supposed to be an enslaved person, I rather object to the smile on the face as though he's happy, et cetera, et cetera. No, this is an enslaved person. George Washington, in a way knew that slavery was wrong, but, but at Mount Vernon, they did have something like 80 slaves. And he dictated that on my death, the slaves will be freed. Manumission was the term for it, but the slaves will be freed. In actual fact, only one slave was freed and that was William Lee. And the reason for that is the other slaves were joint property with his wife, Mary, and she did not agree with that, although they were freed a couple of years later. Um, but this again is all tied in with the, shall we say, the abomination of slavery. There is a very good ex exhibition or permanent exhibit dealing with from slavery to freedom at the Heinz History Center, which deals initially with the overall situation of slavery in North America and then gets a bit more optimistic dealing with, well, how did freedom come about? The, uh, the Underground Railroad, for example, culminating, of course, in the Civil War. But I, I would certainly recommend, obviously, I've mentioned the French and Indian War exhibit, the Innovators exhibit, I would also very much recommend From Slavery to Freedom. Yes. And you talked a little bit about the um the documents that are underfoot in this image. I know it's hard to see them even in our gallery, um, but we were able to zoom in online a little bit and see what they were. Yeah, I, I looked at some of the, I looked at one of the documents and that was saying that it was a proclamation from King George, whatever, saying that if you as a rebel uh, forswear, forswear your allegiance to the rebellion and come back to King George, as it were, then, then that would be okay. In other words, they were trying to undermine the Continental Army, undermine the militias. Um, and again, I, I, I stress that George had tremendous organizational skills to build the Continental Army essentially from scratch, to keep the militias together, to, to make a, a fighting force. When you realize the problems that he was up against, um, Many of the militias were not necessarily uh, very well organized. They would, they would, when when harvest season came around, they would go home and, and, and bring in the crops rather than fight and this sort of thing. Uh, he had all sorts of problems to, to work around in that area. 
I recently read a book by Rick Atkinson, which I can certainly recommend, called The British Are Coming. And it deals with the years 1775 to 1777. He intends doing a trilogy of these books, but it deals with that time. And that does give you an idea the great difficulties that, that the, the, the Continental Army faced in those early days. Just simple things like who's going to produce your gunpowder? If you're not a, an industrialized area, where do you get your gunpowder from? The, French, the, the British had their own problems, of course, having to have all the supplies coming basically from the home country. And disease was also a major problem that was going on. It's a long, long answer to your question, but anyway, yes. <laughs> well, and that, I think in my final question, um, and I will stop sharing our screen so we can see you a little bigger, um, was about you know, I know you've done a lot of reading about this. I know this area is ripe with different places to visit, including the Heinz History Center. But what places would you recommend and what readings would you recommend to people who want to learn more? A very, a very well, obviously we've got the, the Fort Pitt Museum as well. So it, you know, Heinz History Center, very good. The Fort Pitt Museum, walking on the point, and you see the outline of where Fort Duquesne used to be. That's very good grounding. There is a museum in Braddock. The, the actual battlefield at Braddock was completely plowed under by steel mills and so on and so forth. There were no remnants of, of what went on, the, the, the massacre of the money here. There is a small museum there, which is open occasionally. I would particularly reference a, a visit to Fort Necessity. Uh, at one time, it was just a very crude museum. Now it's a very good museum. And you, and you, like, you can walk, of course, onto Great Meadows and get an idea of, of the size of, of the engagement that took place, the size of the stockade, which is very, very small in actual fact. Very little defense. If you're in that area, very close on Route 40, which was the National Road, is, uh, is Braddock's grave. After the massacre of Mon Monongahela, he was mortally wounded. He died several days later. They actually buried him under the road that they were using to transport their wagons and so forth. They buried him under the road such that the Iroquois wouldn't find the body and desecrate the body. And then later on, a skeleton was exhumed. He is buried right beside Route 40, about three miles, two miles away from Fort Necessity. And last but not least, you can visit Humanville Glen, which is where the ambush actually occurred, which started this whole thing. So in that area, so first of all, the Pittsburgh area has got very good museums. And then in the Fort Necessity, Braddock's Grave, Humanville Glen, those are very much worth, worth looking at. And of course, you've got Fort Ligonier and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> So, and it's a beautiful day and you're out traveling, these are good places to go. And most of them, many of them are outside as well. Yes, indeed. I mean, Fort Necessity is, is uh, the museum there, I would definitely recommend to somebody for, for a nice day out. You're very close to the um, Yokogany River and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. It's well worth visiting. Yeah. Well, the um, Smithsonian's Portraits of Pittsburgh is also great to visit and will be with us Ooh. at the beginning of January. So people have a chance to come and see the three portraits that we talked about today, um, as well as what I guess three, then 53 others plus, uh, plus a number of others that are on the digital display as well. So we have a number of portraits there. Uh, and we will continue to do this series on a monthly basis and you'll find other videos on YouTube um, our YouTube channel where we're focused on these portraits now. So thank you so much, Clive, for doing the work to put this together for us and sharing it with us today. Um, and thank everyone for watching. Thank you.